morning we're looking at John chapter 16. If you'd like to turn there, I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. Again, we're going to be centering on what, the, um, well, what Jesus says in verse 8 with regard to the work of the Spirit, which he <coughs> unpacks, as it were, in the, uh, the next three verses. But let me begin reading in uh, verse 1, John 16, beginning in verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. May the Lord bless his word to our uh, understanding this morning. Now again, you'll recall that in the mornings we're wanting to uh, dovetail what we're doing with what we're doing in the evening, which means the theme throughout the week is that of revival. So far we've seen two things that revival brings about, two advantages which are very precious, especially if we have a concern about whether or not Christ's kingdom actually advances in the world. First thing it does is it increases the number of sheep uh, the number of Christ's people that are actually brought savingly to Christ. Because when revival comes, we're going to see this evening particularly, the gospel is preached with much more power than normal. God's people are enlivened. Uh, many more people are actually reached with the gospel, and as a result, many more are saved. We've also seen that revival also causes more of Christ's enemies to bow the knee to him. Remember those, those two works, the work of subduing his enemies by saving them and subduing his enemies by awakening them, striking fear in their heart, causing them to give feigned obedience. Now, it doesn't change their destination. Only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will do that, but it does change their path even if temporarily. Now again, these two things are both God's goals for this world. God has promised to give Jesus two things for his work of redemption. The first is the people for whom he laid down his life. Revival brings these people to him more quickly. But the other is the world. God has promised that Jesus would be king over the world that actually rejected him. Revival advances his rule in the world. So as we continue to consider now the subject of revival, what I want us to do is to go behind the scenes, and again, I think my preview of the sermon has already caused you to guess where we're going next, but to go behind the scenes to see what it is that God actually does in a revival to bring these things about. And that is, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, in our passage, Jesus tells his disciples that he was going away. 
but they were not to be sorry because Jesus said this would be for their advantage. Because he said when he left, he would send the Comforter. He would send the Holy Spirit. And when the Comforter came, he would actually do two things. First of all, he would strengthen the disciples. Basically, personally strengthen them. He would guide them into all the truth. He would build them up in holiness. And of course, from other parts of Scripture, we know as well that he would give them strength and courage to do what the Lord had called them to do. But secondly, he would also help them in the work that Jesus had sent them into the world to do. Remember, the work was to disciple the world. That's a rather tall order. And this is a rather small group of men. At that point, only 11. How were they going to accomplish this? Well, they could not do it except by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit would facilitate this. He would move it ahead by doing a very important work in the hearts of men. He would convict or convince the world of its sin. Now, it should be clear to us by now, I think, that if people are going to change, their hearts have to change. I mean, you can force people to do something for so long. Uh, if you hold a gun on them or something like that, I mean, there's different ways you can put people under duress and you can get them to do certain things. But they're never going to do it willingly unless something changes within. The affections have to be transformed. The truth needs to go beyond the mind and it needs to reach its way into the heart. And that, of course, is what happens in revival. In revival, there are more people who are trusting in the Lord. There are more people who are afraid of the Lord. But the reason why these changes take place, the reason why their hearts are actually being affected by these things is because God is giving a greater measure of His Spirit. The Spirit is at work much more powerfully. So this morning, what I want us to do is consider two things that the Spirit does in revival. First of all, what He does for the unbelieving, and then secondly, what He does for the believer. Now, one thing we do want to bear in mind that when we're talking about revival, we're really not talking about the Spirit of God or God doing anything uh, that's different as far as the character of His work. The Spirit of God is doing what He always does. It's really not different in that regard, but it is more. And that's what it is we need to be seeing and, of course, asking the Lord for that God would do more of this work by His Spirit. Now, first of all, what does the Spirit do in the hearts of the unbeliever? Well, Jesus says He convinces them of the truth, mainly the truth regarding themselves, but also the truth regarding Him. Jesus says, and He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, I hope you understand what he means here by the word convict. When you say you have a conviction, what you mean is that you believe something to be true. Well, the Spirit of God has been sent into the world to bring about this conviction, to convince people, to show them that something is true, to help them to see it for what it really is. And, of course, in this context, it seems to have a negative force, to convince someone of their error to prove to them that they really are guilty and that they have something to be afraid of, at least with regard to the unbeliever. Now, what exactly is it that he's going to convict them of or convince them? Well, first of all, Jesus says he is going to convince them of sin. Now, not just what sin is. You know, that's one of the problems, I think, when we go out to minister to people is we tell them what sin is, but for some reason they think what they're doing is not sin. Really, it doesn't violate God's Word. I mean, we have difficulty with ourselves in that regard, don't we? What I'm doing is not really wrong, and we try to convince ourselves of that, but the Spirit of God has the ability to show us what really is wrong and to convince us that it's wrong so that we will turn away. Well, that's exactly what the Spirit of God does in the unbelieving heart. 
He shows them what sin is, that it really isn't something that is good and right, which they've convinced themselves that it is, but it's really something dishonoring to God. And he shows them that they really have committed those sins. Remember when Nathan the prophet came to David, told him the story about the man who had all these sheep and yet he took the poor man's lamb and he uh, killed it and dressed it for his visitors and David was angry and he says, we, we need to bring that man to judgment and Nathan says, you're the man. And of course the point was he had taken another man's wife when he had several wives of his own. The Spirit of God brings that conviction home, not only showing what sin is, but proving to someone they actually have committed it. Now, of course, he'll also show them what God thinks about it, that it provokes God to anger. I mean, what we've just read in Psalm 5, God abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. God hates all those who do iniquity. That's something that isn't mentioned very often in evangelical churches today. As a matter of fact, um, it wasn't too long ago I preached the sermon on this text and somebody actually saw that on YouTube and, and wrote and asked a question about that and I pointed him to that verse in Psalm 5. God hates all who do iniquity, but the Bible says. We all do iniquity. The whole world is guilty. Nobody does what's good. We all pursue sin unless the Lord turns us around. Well, the Spirit of God will show not only the people of God that that's true, but He'll also show the unbeliever that that is true and that that makes them the objects of God's wrath. Now, again, as Jesus says here, He's not only going to convince them uh, that they're guilty of having committed sin generally, but that they're also guilty of committing the greatest sin, which is refusing to believe in the Son of God refusing to accept Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus denounced Capernaum and Tyre and Sidon. It would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum because he had preached in their streets. To reject the Lord Jesus Christ is a very, a sin and when, is a very serious sin. And when Jesus said this, he undoubtedly had his eye on the Jews who at that time were rejecting him but he was certainly also looking down the corridors of time, realizing that there would be many people in the future who would hear the gospel and receive a great privilege. I mean, think of all the people who, who die never having heard the gospel. And what happens to them? Well, they end up in hell. And that's the reason why we do the work of missions, is to try to reach them before they die with the gospel. It's a great privilege to receive the gospel and to hear the gospel but it's a great sin having heard it not to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit will make sure that they know that as well. By the way, is there anyone here this morning who has heard the gospel and has received that great privilege but hasn't actually trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ personally for the forgiveness of their sins? The Spirit of God is speaking to you this morning and he says, you need to turn from that sin and trust in Jesus. It is his work to show you that. And if he is showing you that, repent and believe. Now, second, Jesus says, he will convince them concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Now, certainly this meant that the Spirit of God, when he came, was going to convince these Jews that they had rejected the one who was in fact righteous. Remember when Jesus leaves the world, he goes to the Father. The fact that the Father raises him from the dead, the fact that the Father raises him up into heaven and seats him in his right hand means that the Father has accepted him and that Jesus is in fact who he said he was, the righteous one, the holy Son of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world and the one who is actually able to give a perfect righteousness, one that is able to make us acceptable to the Father. You see, Jesus is the only one who can do this, and the Spirit of God, when He comes, is going to convince the world that this is true. And we know that that is, in fact, what happened. Remember the example of uh, the day of Pentecost in our meditation, when Peter was preaching what they had done to the holy and righteous one, 
how they were pierced to the heart. That was the work of the Spirit of God. He actually brought it home to them where they could see it and they couldn't escape it. And the effect upon them was they reached out to Christ. What can we do to be saved? And then Peter tells them. And 3,000 repented and believed and were baptized on that day. Now, again, that's what the Spirit of God is saying when He works. And if He is working that conviction within your hearts, and by the way, I should say, whether or not you have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not you've stood up here and actually answered those questions in the affirmative, you realize that you can do that and still be lost. Has the Spirit of God revealed this to you, and have you received Jesus Christ as your righteousness? And does your life show it by living a life of righteousness? You see, if you're trusting in Jesus for His righteousness, it changes the way you live. It actually makes you like Him. Are you like Jesus? You can only be assured that you are the Lord's if your life is being transformed. Again, realizing none of us are going to be perfect by any means. Even to the end of our lives, we won't reach perfection until we reach heaven, but we should be growing in our likeness to Him. So He convicts and convinces the world regarding their sin and regarding righteousness, that they aren't righteous, that they are sinful, but that Jesus is the source of righteousness and that they ought to trust in Him. But thirdly, He will convince the world concerning judgment because He says the ruler of this world has been judged. Spirit of God is going to make it plain to those Jews who accuse Jesus of being in league with the devil. Remember Matthew chapter 12, he casts out demons by the prince of demons, not by the Spirit of God, but by the devil. The Spirit of God is going to convince those Jews that the one that they condemned is actually the one who condemned the devil by casting him out, and the one who has all power and all authority to judge all men for their sins. The Spirit of God is going to reveal that regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who's going to bring it home. And again, if the Spirit of God has shown this to you, this is an act of mercy. God does not do this for everyone, but He does it for His people. And if the Lord is speaking to you regarding that, you need to realize if you don't listen to the Spirit of God and if you don't turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior, one day you will face Him as your judge and He will condemn you. But He offers you pardon today, forgiveness of all your sins if you will simply trust in Him. And if you do, then you will be able to stand before Him in the judgment among the sheep and be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is the work the Spirit of God has come to do, to convince the world that they've sinned, to convince them that Jesus alone is the source of righteousness, the only righteousness that makes one acceptable to God, and to convince the world that if they don't turn from their sins to Him, that they will see Him one day in judgment against them. Now, Jesus said it was good that He left so that this helper would come. And I hope you understand this morning what a great help the Spirit of God is because without the Spirit's work, everything that we're doing to try to reach the lost, everything we're doing this morning, everything we're doing in our discipleship courses, all of our study of the Bible and how to bring the gospel across to someone is all really going to be worthless and useless because what good is it to tell someone that they've sinned and that they're in need of a perfect righteousness or they're going to be judged one day by the Lord Jesus Christ if they don't believe what you're telling them. Now again, think about this uh, because this is one of our number one hurdles that we have to overcome in order to bring the gospel to other people. We're afraid they're going to look at us and say, you're crazy and you're just a fanatic. You can't prove anything that you've said. And they're just going to make fun of you. Well, you know what, apart from the Spirit of God, that's probably what they're going to do uh, because He's the only one who can do this. But with the Spirit's work here to convince them, 
they will see it. You don't actually even have to prove it through facts. The Spirit of God will bring it home with such power they can't deny it. One thing we're going to see about the revival this evening is that these things that people heard of and, and kept at a distance and thought was just fairy tales and fables suddenly came home with such power that they could not escape it. And they felt like they were standing before God already on the day of judgment and were going to be condemned for their sins and they cried out for mercy. That's what the Spirit of God can do through just the preaching of the Word of God and without all the books on science and apologetics and everything else that we often use to try to convince people. It's not that those things don't have value. I think they do have value. But unless the Spirit of God brings it home, it's not going to have any effect on those people, and at least any saving effect. So the Spirit of God is the one who's going to convince them. The Lord has charged us with bringing the gospel to others. He has charged us with declaring to them God's righteous standard. He has told us to offer to the world the word of reconciliation so that people might be saved through Jesus Christ but he sent his spirit to convince them that what we are telling them is actually the truth. Actually, what I've just said talks about not only the advantage of the spirit of God for the unbeliever, but also for us. He is our ally to help us in the work that Jesus has called us to do. But again, realize that his work is necessary before any unbeliever is actually going to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be able to compel people to come up and make a decision uh, to pray a prayer, but their hearts are not going to be changed unless they see it for themselves. And the Spirit of God is the only one who can really bring it to their attention in the way they need to see it. He's the one who can shine the light in the darkness. He's the one who can convince them beyond a shadow of a doubt. By the way, he does the same thing for believers. And that's the reason why you and I believe these things are true, and if your faith in what the Word of God says is running low, then you need more of the Spirit of God. And that's where we turn to next with regard to what does the Spirit do for the believer. Well, Jesus gave us a bit of information on that too. He says He works in our hearts to guide us, to comfort us, or as we know better, to exhort us or encourage us and from other parts of Scripture, to strengthen us. Jesus said the Spirit would guide us into all the truth. Now again, He didn't mean this the way that some charismatic churches teach, that we don't need the Bibles, we can just put the Bible away and just sort of uh, go with whatever we feel the Spirit of God is telling us to do. That is not how the Spirit of God guides us. He guides us in the Word. Nor that He has sent the Spirit of God into the world simply to help you find fulfillment in life so that you can uh, live to the fullest and grab for all the gusto and so forth through the things of the world, find pleasure. That's not why God sent the Spirit of God into the world. Sometimes people think that He was sent only to enhance what we want to do, but that's not why He was sent. He was sent to guide us into the truth and to show us what we need to serve the Lord, what we need to do to glorify the Lord, and how we might truly enjoy Him. And it's only in the path of obedience. It's only in the path of self-sacrifice. I mean, where did Paul and Silas find their joy? Was it, hey, let's, let's go to this new restaurant and, and see what the food's like. I mean, that's not what brought them joy. That's not why they were praying and singing hymns. It was because they had done the Lord's work and they suffered for it. That's what brought them joy. And that's what the Spirit of God led them to do. Now, it's not the Spirit of God is always going to be pushing us in areas that are very difficult, but oftentimes He will. There will be times of refreshment, but He will lead us also into the paths of usefulness. And when He does, there is going to be a cost involved, but there's going to be joy, greater joy. Jesus said He will also comfort and encourage you, as we were reminded last Lord's Day from the fellowship devotional. And again, I hope you're all reading those things because they're very helpful. That the Spirit of God is the paraclete. He is the comforter. 
He is the one the Lord has sent to strengthen and encourage us. He is the one who has the ability to stoke the fire in our hearts, to keep our hearts, as it were, uh, enlivened and inflamed with devotion for the Lord. He can do that because he is the flame in our heart. He can make it greater. He can make it weaker, depending upon how we live. But the Spirit of God is the one who is the fire. He's the fire that comes down from heaven that lights the altar of our hearts. And he's the one who can turn it into a blaze. And that is the work that he has been sent to do, to encourage us in the Lord, to make us, as it were, move forward in the things of the Lord. And, of course, he is the one, too, that will give us boldness to do what he calls us to do. By the way, if you know the Spirit of God is going to work as you go out to tell the gospel to others, that should be a tremendous encouragement right there. Again, our number one obstacle is these people are going to think I'm foolish and they're going to make fun of me and I don't like that. But if the Spirit of God is working, this person is going to be convicted and this person is going to repent and trust in Jesus and a soul is going to be saved from hell. You know, those same souls that we, that we think of when they, when they die, I wish I had done more to reach out to them. Now they're lost forever. The Spirit of God will help us reach them before that happens with the gospel. Now, Jesus perhaps implies that in the fact that the Spirit of God is our paraclete, but he certainly says clearly to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2.7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. What more do you need than that to be able to do what the Lord has called you to do? So the Spirit of God will show us how to advance the kingdom of heaven. He will continually encourage us to advance it, giving us the desire to move it forward. He will give to us guidance. He will give to us courage and love and discipline. By the way, in order to get that help of the Holy Spirit, you and I do need to be using the means of grace, which is what we're doing right now. And this will give us the help that we need but we need to do it faithfully, not just for the short period of time on the Lord's Day. We need to be in the Word all the time. We need to be meditating on the Word. We need to be praying all the time. And we need to be submitting to the Lord. Because every time we fail to submit to Him, we quench the Spirit of God and that flame of devotion gets that much weaker. Remember that everything we are to do, we are to do to the glory of God, whether we're working at home, whether we're dealing with our children, whether children you're, you're interacting with your parents, whether we're working at our secular jobs, whatever it may be, or whether we're in church or fellowshipping or observing a Sabbath day. Everything that we do is to be done for the glory of God, and as we do those things, the work of the Spirit becomes stronger in our hearts and we experience more of these things. So again, let's not forget the big picture. Everything that God does, everything that He has made, His entire plan, which includes everything that comes to pass, all of you, myself, everyone in the world, everything has been made for one purpose and that is the work of redemption. And everything that God does is to advance that work whether it's gathering in his sheep through the gospel or subjecting his enemies through the gospel. And the way that he does this is by our getting the gospel out to others so that the Spirit of God can do his work. We are going to see the Spirit of God might do certain things apart from the proclamation of the word, but he doesn't come on with full strength until that gospel is preached. Revival is simply turning that process up. It's like when you're going to put a pot of water on the stove and you want it to boil. You can turn the flame up slowly, you know, a small flame. It'll take a long time for the pot to boil, especially if you watch it. Or you can turn it up full blast and the pot will boil more quickly. Well, that's what God does in revival. He turns up the fire, which is what the Spirit of God is, a holy fire, and He makes the process move more quickly. He makes him work more powerfully in the hearts of his elect that are to be gathered by awakening them and converting them in the hearts of his enemies 
by convincing them of sin and righteousness and judgment and striking fear in their hearts so that they will submit to him. And of course, in our hearts, to guide us, to encourage us, to strengthen us in our love for the lost and in our conviction that these things are real, not just things we talk about on the Lord's Day. These things are really happening all around us, even though when you walk out the door following the service, you'll see the world just as it was. You need to remember what you saw here, what the Spirit of God revealed to you, because that is really what matters. This is just the, the field in which the work is going to take place. It's not going to happen by itself. You're not going to see people falling over or people being converted on the street without any interaction from you or from other Christians. Things are going to be just as you saw them, but you do need to see them in this light. Spirit of God wants to work. God wants us to take the gospel out in order that people might be convicted. Now, the Lord has already sent His Spirit. The Spirit of God is already at work in the world. It's our duty to be filled with the Spirit so that we might do what it is that God has called us to do. And by the way, He also has given us His Spirit so that we might pray for more of His Holy Spirit. One of the things we need to do is to pray that God would send His Spirit in great power to advance the kingdom of heaven so that those who are sleeping in, in the sleep of death that's going to lead them to hell might be awakened and that the Lord's sheep might actually be brought savingly in. If you look at the history of the church, you'll find that those churches were most greatly blessed, both by their own spiritual growth and maturity and by the number of souls they saw come to Christ. They, the, the churches that were most greatly blessed were the ones that gave most of their attention to this particular work because this is the work that the Lord has made everything for. Now, next week, we're going to want to focus a little bit more on what the Lord calls us to be so that we might do what He calls us to do. But for now, let's pray that God would work in our hearts to bring these things about that we've seen and in the hearts of the lost by His Holy Spirit so that His kingdom might move forward. I would encourage you to come this evening. Um, I don't think I have seen anything more encouraging than the Great Awakening. And we looked at the revival of 1735, and that was encouraging, but the Great Awakening was much, much greater, much more ex extensive. And we get to see some of the, uh, the greatest evangelists at work, although we're not going to focus on all of them. But we will take time to look at the interaction between Whitfield and Edwards and the tenants and, and how the Lord used them uh, and others as well. Sadly, we don't have pictures of everyone we're going to be looking at because those were far and few between in those days. But the work that God did paints a much uh, more vivid picture than any picture we might see just of their face. So I would encourage you this evening to take the time to come and don't just watch it online. If you can be here, try to be here. It's certainly more encouraging when we're all together to experience this together, but I think you will be encouraged by the things we see, and I think it will, in some measure, revive you and awaken you and refresh you. And then when the Lord does that, you need to take that and, as it were, run with it, try to preserve it, try to build it, and try to keep going up. You know, Paul says that the Christian life is like, like a race that has to be run. It's like a boxing match that has to be fought. There is work involved. If we have this all open to us and we're encouraged for a moment through all the labors that have just taken place and we do nothing with it, when we leave, next week we're going to be in the same place we were this week. We have to act on it. We have to build on it. That's really the secret of Christian maturity and growth, looking to the Lord continually and not just for a few moments on the Lord's Day. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord by His Spirit to bring these things home to our hearts.